Hello, I'm Barry Silverberg, Director of the Center for Nonprofit Studies at Austin Community College, and this is Civil Society, a periodic podcast to provoke more thinking about issues affecting nonprofit effectiveness and success. My guest today is Bill Stotesbury, CEO and General Manager of KLRU TV, Austin PBS, a position he's held for 14 years since 2004. During that time, Bill has overseen considerable growth at KLRU. Previously, Bill had a 25-year career in marketing, sales, public relations, and public affairs, primarily for technology companies. I first met Bill about a year ago. It was self-evident from our first meeting that he's passionate about public television and our community. He serves on a numerous, on numerous civil and professional boards and been recognized for his community leadership. Bill, welcome. Thank you, Barry. Proud, proud so, to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to start off with, as I do with most of my guests, so why do you do what you do? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question because it's important, I, I think, you know, for all of us to do things we really enjoy and love. And uh, broadcasting for me has always been uh, a passion. You know, as a kid growing up, I was a TV watcher. I was one of those kids that watched TV when I did my homework. Uh, when I finally came to Austin, uh, I, I watched KLRU. I wanted to go to Austin City Limits tapings, and then one day the opportunity came to become a part of the station. And what I learned was that PBS was even a, a broader, more exciting place to be than, I, than I, as a viewer I realized it was, because we had extensive activities going on in the community. We do 36,000 hours of programming every year across four channels. We, of course, have Austin City Limits as one of the flagship productions of the station. And when you put all that together as part of a national network that provides incredible service to communities all across the nation, it's just a very exciting place to be. And as we discussed the other day, you're probably the only person in Austin who has no problem getting tickets to Austin City Limits. It, it's one of the perks of the job, there's yep. no question. In the years before I came, when I was in Austin before I came to work at the station, I was like everybody else trying to get, a, you know, how do I get into CACL? And, you know, now, you know, I, it's, it's part of the job. So well, I there's worse ways to make a living. I feel sorry for you. <laughs> so let's go to basics. Why does public television exist? Public television exists because they're uh, left, to, left to the marketplace. Um, there are things that don't get done. Uh, there are people who um, don't get to see the opera. There are dramas that will not get made because they don't appeal to the larger common denominator. There are science programs and history. There uh, is content and educational opportunities that stretch from very early learners all the way through people our age. Um, that if there wasn't a service out there that delivered them without having to worry about commercial numbers and ratings and revenue in the same way that our commercial brethren do, um, it would be, be a much different uh, situation. You know, networks over the years like Discovery and Bravo and A&E came into existence to do the same thing as PBS. And over the years we saw shows like Ice Road Truckers and uh, How The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills come along and uh, you know, unfortunately, frequently commercial television resorts to that. Um, public broadcasting can stay above it and continue to deliver high quality content that stretches across a broad range of subjects. So over the years and during your tenure and certainly before your tenure, the nature of public television has changed. It has. Can you, can you just briefly talk about where it's come from, where it is, and maybe where it's going? Well, I think you know, without question, there are certain things that have remained the same. Uh, commitment to quality, uh, commitment to honesty, commitment to uh, protect the trust that the community has traditionally had in public television. Those things have stayed the same. What's changed is the technology of broadcasting has changed radically. Um, now, instead of uh, one channel that's on 12 hours a day or 10 hours a day like it might have been at the back at the beginning, now we carry four channels that are 24-7, 365, in addition to thousands of hours of content that has to be available online. So we have to have expertise that goes beyond traditional broadcasting. Right. And we have to actively engage on the ground in, in community activity and workshops and screenings and events and all the various things that bring people closer to KLRU but they're beyond television beyond you know things that happen on screen so public broadcasting has grown in the scope of its engagement with the community it's grown in the size and amount of the content that it has to create and produce and really with the style and the format of the content that we deliver because we have to be competitive with those 
those networks with right. not only the commercial networks now, but with Netflix and with Hulu and Amazon and all the, the new competitors in the marketplace. So that brings to, to the question of what are the major challenges that uh, public television is facing in 2018 and beyond? Well, there are, there are challenges you hear a lot about. Maintaining federal funding, for example, is a very important thing, and it, and it clearly is a challenge. Uh, you hear about the challenge of uh, you know, dealing with producers and you know, things like that, but, but really the most fundamental challenge that's affecting public broadcasting is also the most fundamental challenge that's affecting every broadcasting, and that is the massive change in the way people consume media. Mm -hmm. It started as a generational change, so our kids and our kids' kids don't really watch appointment television anymore. They now we watch television on their phones, they watch Netflix, Hulu, over the top. It, it's changed the whole way that what we produce ends up coming into, into uh, your living room or even right. not in your living room. And adapting to that is probably the single most important change we're going to have to deal with over the next five to ten years. And, and you'd also mentioned the changes in broadcast signal technology, right? Yeah, I mean, which apparently is upcoming. Oh well, there's a there's a big change in broadcast signal technology coming along. A few years ago, people may remember we went, we did what was called the analog to digital transition, uh, where old style analog television gave way to new digital television, and with that came the advent of more channels. And so we used to just be one channel. You know, we joked before the show about remember when there were just three channels, That's three right. networks. Good old days. Good old days when you didn't have to have a hundred. 57 channels on your tuner and figure out what you were going to watch. Um, but um, now the new change is bringing in a new standard for how we compress the signal, how we shrink the signal so we can squeeze more in the pipe that we have to squeeze content through. And instead of four channels, we're going to be off, be able to offer 10 or 15 channels. Uh, uh -huh. And not just us, but everybody's going to be going through that. So instead of 157 channels, you have the potential for 1,000 channels coming into your house you know, across, across the signal. It's going to complicate the process of competing in a content marketplace even more. And, just as a personal comment, increase the mediocrity of what we're watching. Well, and, and one Except for KLRU. Well, thank you. And, and you know, I, I, I will say that, you know, one of the things right now that's happening is you've got some non-public broadcasting uh, companies that are producing some great stuff. I mean, some of what Netflix putting up is amazing. Yep. The Crown is, you know, an amazing program that every time I watched it, all I could think of is I wish, I wish, I wish this was on PBS. Um, so there is some, some good, high-quality stuff coming other than on PBS, which is great. But unfortunately, I think the vast majority of that thousand channels is, is going to be naked and afraid. So many, like people, yeah, well, many people take uh, public television for granted. Mm -hmm. um, I, as we were talking, many people think, as I thought, that KLRU was part of, wholly owned part of AUT. Um, and learned um, that you're really an independent channel representing mm -hmm. the community rather right. than any other or institution. 501c3, completely By independent God. community. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So um, with, with that in mind, um, how do you relate to the educational institutions in town, community organizations? We have a lot of activity going on with educational organizations and community institutions. Right now, for example, we have a series of projects that are uh, they're national projects that we've been fortunate enough to competitively be funded, uh, primarily funded by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. So, for example, we have partnerships with the Thinkery, with the Boys and Girls Clubs, with communities mm -hmm. and schools, and with a wide variety of others, United Way of Greater Austin. Um, and where our particular focus is in our hands-on work is working generally in non-school district child care facilities, and so places where kids stay when um, after school or you know weekends that need more resources in order to provide those kids an educational uh, opportunity even while they're playing. Um, we also have some amazing uh, services. Uh, PBS Learning Media is uh, uh, basically a catalog of all of the content that PBS has produced over the years, cut into short segments and indexed by grade level and subject matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can sign up for it as a teacher for your classroom, deliver video into your classroom. You can even sign up as a parent. There's no cost. PBS Learning Media um, is, the, is the name of the service. So if your viewers are interested, it's a great tool. And a lot of other things like that that, that focus primarily on kids from 2 to 10. And then we kind of lose them. And then you know we start to come back in as kids hit their late teens and early 20s, and idea particularly as kids turn into parents and begin to have kids of their own, and we go back to that you know 
virtuous cycle back to the early two to ten again. Yeah, we, we joke about the spaceship coming, taking them at thirteen and bringing them back <laughs> when they're eighteen. Uh, so I, 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 there's there's a certain amount of truth in that. Let me turn to some of the issues in our contemporary sure. society. So on your website, it states that PBS is number one in public trust more than any other news source. In a world where fake, quote, fake news is so pre prevalent, what is the role of public television in dealing with that unfortunate reality? Well, you know, the, the patron saint of news on PBS is Jim Lehrer. McNeil Lehrer of NewsHour was the, the granddaddy of all of the you know, really serious programs. And what distinguished them in their news delivery was um, they'd spent more time to develop stories in longer formats. So instead of a commercial news broadcast that maybe a, did a minute 30 on a major story, they would spend 10 minutes on a story and provide the context right. and background right. and detail. They do it in a non-hysterical manner. If you watch, you know, whether you're watching Fox News or MSNBC or CNN, that constant battling for uh, who's going to who can speak the loudest and who can speak over the other person becomes such a distraction that you really can't absorb much you don't see that on PBS um, so it's how do you deliver fair honest journalism through um, uh, w with a, a, a uh, priority given to civil dialogue um, in communities or on a national level. That's an important part of what we do. One of the things Lara talks about is, you know, there's three things you have to be aware of. You have to know the difference between journalism and opinion and analysis. Reporting, news, uh, opinion, and analysis. And I think PBS does a good job of labeling what it is that we're doing. We know on the news hour you're going to hear news. We know there's going to be a time when you're going to hear analysis and it'll be branded as such. And we know at the end you're going to hear some opinion. Um, but we're going to try to provide balanced opinion. That's what, what really, uh, I think, makes it very special. Mm -hmm. Which is more that on, on the other stations. Unfortunately. So how will public television, do you project, is going to change in the next five to ten years? I think that's both in content, and you talked about technology, but also sure. I, and I think that's what we're all trying to figure out. I think um, with that change in the way media is consumed, particularly by the younger generation, it, PBS is going to have to think in new production styles, new formats. Um, I think we all think in long form, by and large, because you know, typically when we present a documentary, it's a 60 or even a 90 minute documentary. We go out, you put that out into the world of YouTube or Facebook, that doesn't work very well. Right. Uh, you can link to that and give an option to view later. And so thinking about how you build your content across multiple platforms simultaneously, or transmedia as, as it's referred to, is gonna be a huge part of what we do. Now having said that, you know, the, I think one of the big challenges um, in all of that is everybody can be a broadcaster today. There's no longer, used to be we had a big barrier to entry for anybody to be right. a broadcaster. You had to have a broadcast license. You don't need that anymore. You have, a, you have an iPhone, you go out, you hold your iPhone up, and you can distribute it to more people than you know, we reached in the first 20 years combined probably, yep. you know, just with that. So figuring out how to distinguish ourselves from a, for as, a con, as a quality content creator and mastering the distribution of that content is going to be critical to us. There's going to be big changes in PBS there. And then finally, how do we engage with our community more effectively and, and more intensively? We really have to put a premium on collaborating with other organizations in town. We have to m help other organizations be more than they could be without us. Because if we can help lift up those organizations, it'll demonstrate the value of what we have to offer. And that's mm -hmm. something we've done in the past, but I think it's going to have to become more of a mantra for us as we look forward. Well, it seems to me that'd be a critical component to maintain the local connection absolutely, to Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And locality, you know, everybody says locality is what's going to be the most important thing in the future, and it's always been important, and it's important now, and it will be important in the future. But defining what that means um, and figuring out how to really establish yourself as a, as a key institution in the civic life of the community is what's so critical. Mm. What, what do you find is the challenges to achieving that here in Austin? Well, um, obviously Austin is a great town to be a public broadcasting station. It's an educated town, um, although you know, I think Austin is challenged by, a, by 
both socioeconomic and digital divides that we still haven't figured out fully how to overcome. By and large, Austin has, is an affluent town with a strong economy, so those things are all good. I think the challenges, though, are that it's a large number of nonprofits. Austin has the highest number of nonprofits per capita in, the, in Texas and in, I think, in the Southwest region based on some numbers out of uh, the Bush School at, at A&M. Uh, so it's a very competitive market for nonprofits. Um, that means that when we're seeking philanthropic support, uh, it establishes a higher bar for proving ourselves, demonstrating our impact, uh, you know, making ourselves um, the kind of organization that the philanthropic community wants to support. That's a critical issue. I think Austin is a young community, um, and that's a challenge for public broadcasting because our on-air viewership tends to be 55 and up. And so that 18 to young 30. Folks. Young folks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. The, you know, my, my kids. Uh, <laughs> and so the, the 18 to 35 generation or, or 25 to 45 demographic um, isn't wed to us in the same way their parents were. And right. so since Austin's really dominated by that age group, how we get out and make ourselves known to them is really, is really critical. Um, and I think the other, the other issue uh, in Austin is there's just so darn much to do. It's a, it's a town that has a lot of opportunity, a lot of content creators, a lot of interesting things going on, and so we've got to make sure what we're doing stays relevant and warrants people's attention. That's a very interesting. So if I'm a viewer and I want to get involved, Clearly, I can make a contribution. Yeah, I would uh, okay. be happy to do it. And I'm sure that you can do that any time of the sure. year, not just during the fun drive. No, nope, Or is absolutely. it only limited during the fun drive? No, 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 no. <laughs> www.klru.org. Okay. Hit the donate button. That's right. Good. Um, not too strongly. Just press That's it. That's right, yeah. Just yeah, press it. Exactly. So how else might I, as an interested member of the community, one of our viewers, perhaps, get more involved in promoting what is obviously a very noble cause. Well, we'd love to have you watch. Um, you know, we, we love that when people donate, there's no question about that. That's what allows us to do, you know, thanks to viewers like you. That's more than just a slogan, it actually is true. Uh, we depend on our viewers for a, 80 percent of our revenue that comes into the station comes from the local community and so mm -hmm. it's critical we have that support but you know if you don't donate we at least want you to watch and if you watch we want you to talk to people we'd love it if you used your social media your tweet stream to talk about something that you're watching if you think downton abbey's great let people know about it if you think victoria or poldark are great let people know about it so becoming an active part of becoming an active advocate for the station is great now Beyond that, there's lots of stuff that we do in the community. We have um, opportunities for volunteers, uh, various things that we do, and the best way to do that is to contact the station. You can just send me an email. I'm easy to reach. It's bill at klru.org. Um, or we have screenings. Uh, we do tapings. Come to an Austin City Limits taping. Uh, you can get tickets. Well, and you know, <laughs> bill at klru.org. Let me know. When, I know. Uh, but we have, we actually do draw. We always have free community tickets for ACL tapings. You just have to go to the to the uh, uh, the drawing, the on air. Right. Uh, I mean, right. the online uh, uh, lottery, um, and. For everything else that we do, things like sh taping Overheard with Evan Smith, doing kids events on the weekends, you can get that from the website, and we'd love to see you and have you come out and be a part of the family. Well, and I was looking at the website in preparation for our comms, I was impressed by the number of activities. There's a lot of activities. And, you know, a lot of stuff going on there, and... Uh, we did over 120 activities last year, wow. and this year so far in the first six months at various KLRU activities, we have over 20,000 people that we've encountered. Wow. Wow. So, is there anything else you'd like to say to the viewers that I may not have asked you? Um, any secret information you want to share? Uh, I don't really have any secret information that okay. I can share at this point. There's lots of interesting things ahead of us, um, and you know, I think the community will hear more about that as the, as the weeks uh, and months unfold. There are some announcements we'll be making about some new things that we're excited about. That said, um, things we're always excited about are new programs uh, that are coming up. We've got, uh, the, uh, we've got civilizations that are airing right now. Uh, we uh, have just recently introduced uh, a new concept, which is there's a show called Jamestown, which is brought to you by the folks who brought you down Abbey. That's available through our service called Passport, which is um, available if you become a member of KLRU and you'll get activation of your passport service and then you can have access to shows like, like Jamestown. Um, we have the 24-7 Kids Channel now firmly in place on Channel 18.4. It started that last April 1st. And in this year, it's been amazing to watch the acceptance by the community. We'll have 
we'll have five, 6,000 households watching at 7.30 p.m. to watch a kids show, because uh, there's no other young kids, right. two to 10 year old right. kids content on at 7 p.m., 7.30 yeah. p.m. So there's a lot of things we could talk about. Uh, let me just you know say that KLRU is an exciting place to be, and it's an exciting place to be whether you're there on TV, whether you're watching it through TV, or you're, you're a part of the station. Well, it's a great asset for the community. Appreciate and, uh, that. We you know. we hope so, and we appreciate that. And so is ACC, and uh, so is, so is the institute. So well, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Please um, visit our website, nonprofitaustin.org/slash/civil-society, to read more about public television and KLRU, and share your comments on today's podcast. This is Barry Silverberg with Civil Society, a Center for Nonprofit Studies podcast in collaboration with ACC-TV. Thank you for joining us today.